At a time when energy costs are high, global warming is melting glaciers, and we're facing tough economic times, can we afford to live green? The answer, next on Living Smart. Welcome to Living Smart, the show designed to help you get the most out of life. Mark Allen Robinson spent his childhood summers living in a cabin by a lake. Eventually got his master's degree in entrepreneurship and became a green consultant. He chose his sustainability route before it was popular. He teaches people and companies how to live green and why it is strategically smart for business. Today he will share how to save up to $60,000 in five years and how you can become an inspiration by Living Green. Thank you so much for joining us, Mark. Thank you, Patty. It's great to have you here. Now, what, how do you define exactly Living Green? Because it's sort of a vague term. Oh, Live Green, it can be so many different things. Living Green, by some, is d defined as being conservative or efficient. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there's the health and productivity and people aspect. Um, this is really the bulk of what sustainability is all about. Uh, another way to look at it is, they say, is it more ex expensive? Um, right. It costs so much to upfront to be green. Well, there's really the life cycle cost that we take into consideration when we look at being green. It's uh, yeah. not just what do we pay today. It's how much do we save you. for a long time? Yeah, I was going to ask you, uh, can we afford to live green? Because a lot of people say, oh, that's just too much trouble and it's so expensive. What, what do you respond to that? I'm sure you get that in your courses. It is tough sometimes, especially when you're an early adopter or an innovator. <laughs> <laughs> Before there's even anything available, right. you have to go out and kind of invent it. Right. Um, but it's, it's very affordable to live green. For instance, when you have a baby, uh, this is the best way we looked at it. It only costs about six to eight, maybe ten thousand dollars to have a baby, but over twenty-two years, it costs over three hundred thousand dollars to take care of that baby. So it's very affordable if you can shrink that life cycle cost. Yeah, let's let's save some money and, and uh, enjoy living at the same time. Now, before you had that baby, you had your green wedding, and and you sort of became a local celebrity with this green wedding. Tell me about your green wedding and and how much it cost you. The Green Wedding was a lot of fun. Uh, it was a learning curve for sure. Uh, we saved probably $18,000. Uh, the average wedding in Houston is about $27,000 $28,000. And it's about that nationwide, too. Mm -hmm. So we saved about 50%. We did 78 different things to be green. Yeah, it was a spreadsheet. That's a lot, yeah. Uh, wedding planning is tough, but green wedding planning is even harder. Uh, but it, it really did make a, a difference. We asked four questions. That we do in business too. Uh, does this save money? Does this help our neighbor, make me a friendlier person, a better neighbor? Does this help the world? And then for us, since faith is a big part of our life, we said, does this bring us closer to God? So if we could answer yes to all four of those questions, we made the decision, and in the end, we saved $18,000. I want to know, give me some examples of some of the important things that you did for this. I mean, you got 78. We can't go into 78. But no, we don't have time for most, that. That's right, but give me some of the most important things so that people can start thinking about this. Well, one of the initial things we did was said we want to be local. We okay. want to use uh, imp local vendors, minority-owned vendors, uh, student-run businesses. That, that kept everything local, transportation costs. That was an intangible uh, savings. We kept everybody at one hotel. So they would get to know each other better, oh, and neat. we saved a lot more money. It was very close to the church. We did everything at the church, the reception, the wedding, everything. Uh, so no transportation, no wasted time, plenty of time with people. Uh, the best thing that really captures a lot of people's attention, especially the guys, is the wedding ring and the engagement ring. We were lucky enough, fortunate enough, to receive one of the first two pure, man-made, flawless diamonds in the world. Uh, it was less than a carat, but it had not one flaw in it, and it was a lot less expensive. Wow. So it was a perfect diamond. So those diamond. are some, some examples. It sounds like you have to have friends locally to be green. Actually. You can't have friends all over the world the, because the they have to fly in. Was in the, well, that's true. <laughs> we, we were older when we got married, right. and we wanted to have a big, you know, this is a dream of most of us. Right. Uh, so we had to pay for most of it ourselves since we were older. So in order to do that, entrepreneurially, we had to be creative. And had the big, beautiful, elegant wedding simply and really made a difference in the world. Made it in like nine magazines and, yeah, saved right. a lot in the pocketbook. Carbon, carbon footprint. I mean, you know, one of the things that really struck me about carbon footprint, I love to travel. And it says, look, if you fly on a plane, 
Mm, your carbon footprint goes. Explain what it is and, and what do we need to be aware of? Basically, carbon is a problem because it's a greenhouse gas or carbon dioxide. And that's what's causing the climate change, global warming. It creates a blanket or that yeah, heats up the planet. Um, so in order to reduce that radiative effect, um, we want to reduce emissions. Uh, okay. Simply put, buildings, transportation, food or food transportation, lots of things. There's some seven primary areas that we can reduce uh, today. Electricity. Uh, is an easy one. It's hard to really put our arms around carbon dioxide, so what I try to translate it into is how many uh, homes electricity are we equating something to, or mm -hmm. how many trees could we go plant. Right. Um, so carbon, we really are trying to reduce that worldwide because it's going up dramatically since the Industrial Revolution. Uh, uh, you talked about energy efficiency. One of the things that we can easily do, share some of the things that we can easily do, but one is just changing your light bulb. I mean, how much can you save with that? In our home, a lot. well, you combine some of the technologies like changing light bulbs with conservation, not leaving the light on like your parents always told you. Right. Uh, switching out for appliances for Energy Star appliances when you replace, not just to go replace. Right. Um, combining a lot of efforts, we saved 50% in our home relative to other average Houston households. And that's possible nationwide. You also talked about electricity as far as like turning the heater on. Sometimes you don't need to turn the heater on. Maybe you can just wear more coat, you know, wear a blanket, right? Well, I mean, that, you do that, right? That was something, especially as a especially single guy. Especially in our guy. climate. Yeah, it's true. It's 80 <laughs> degrees all the time in Houston. It's kind of odd. Uh, we have four seasons in one week sometimes. Right. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so, yeah. But, yeah, there's, there's definitely ways um, that you can conserve and not turn on the heat or the electricity. Unfortunately, like now that we have a baby, at night you can't let the right. house get down to right. 60 because right. the baby's just going to freeze uh, <laughs> unless right. you bundle up. Yeah, that's just right. not practical. Right. Uh, we've seen our bills go up slightly but uh, with the baby. But there's still, we're, we're saving 50%. And our water, we've saved 95%. What do you do to save that water? Well, you we don't, don't leave the faucet, the faucet on. You right. don't leave the shower on. Like, you know, right. Army, our military, uh, my grandfather was in the military and really inspired me. Uh, to turn it on, turn it off. Right. Um, but low flow air, uh, sink aerators that reduce the flow from 2.2 gallons a minute down to 0.5. So instantly you're saving shower head, same thing. You can take it from 5 or even sometimes 10 gallons a minute all the way down to 2 or 1 and something. Mm -hmm. So we were able to reduce it to 1 to 3,000 gallons a month. Amazing. Uh, my best friend, uh, he actually, with several kids and in a different part of the, the state, uses sometimes over 20,000 gallons a month. Um, it's amazing what you can do. And he's, he's reduced that dramatically, too. Uh, now we're an inspiration you get to on each them, other. Right, that's right. Now, you said there are eight things you can do to save $60,000 in the I next five years. Did I say that? <laughs> you said, maybe you'll change your mind, but that's what you said. Give, give us some tips on, on you know, saving those $60,000 in five years. Well, before we talk about that, I would say let's focus on the money, but also focus on the people and the planet. Absolutely. Money comes things, first. Right. Uh, so the first thing we did was transportation. We noticed that a lot of cars nowadays are depreciating rapidly or they're upside down. They're saying buy one, get one free. The auto industry is having a hard time. We, when we had to replace a car, we chose a hybrid. And our particular hybrid uh, is one of the best. And we doubled our gas mileage, basically. And we reduced our pollution in half. And during the highest gas prices, we could have sold our used car, two years old, for three to eight thousand dollars more than we paid for it. Um, nowadays, I just checked today, and the uh, actual sales price that it's going for, two years later, is only about three to four thousand dollars less than brand new. Car payments are five hundred dollars a month. That's about eight hundred eighty dollars a month in depreciation. So we're profiting three hundred plus a month. There's no depreciation, and once gas prices go back up, or you know wherever they end up. Pollution in the garage also is a major factor. Now with a baby and a wife, right. I don't want our attached garage turn on the car, have the pollution go right into our home, right. or have my wife at the gas pump twice as much. Let's do it half as much so mm -hmm. she's not breathing the pollutants, the poisons. Okay. So, yeah, that saved in depreciation and gas probably five to $10,000 in five years, okay. uh, which is pretty amazing for that a is, car. That is a lot. Okay. Um, What's the next one? Well, if you have a kid, we chose to do uh, dis uh, not disposable diapers all the time, which are one of the top two landfill items in America. 
Um, That's very true. Yeah, that and carpet. The carpet industry has done a great job to reduce. But we, we switched to... Uh, green diapers. Green diapers, yeah. Cloth Which diapers, is, but they're yeah. cutting edge now. There's, oh. uh, they're much better, and they have snaps. There's several different varieties, but they can grow with the child. We've had very little trouble um, with the diapers uh, leaking or anything, and we save about $2,000 per kid. So wow. if we have a family, okay. if God blesses us with a family of four, right. well, that's $8,000. So another way to be green is not to have kids, right? <laughs> well, yeah, some people say we need a smaller planet no and stop procreating. Uh, but what, yeah. no, with our lifestyle, we can afford to have sure, four kids sure, easily. Sure. And, and what's, what's some other ones? You said you have about eight different things you can do. I would say, not to give away all the secrets, right, but right. Uh, the electricity we've already mentioned. You know, reduce your bill by 50% by doing mm. a combination of things. Uh, one of the big things that helped us... Black asphalt and black rooftops Mm -hmm. cause a heat island effect. Cities are hotter by anywhere from 6 to 10 degrees hotter. So our black rooftop, you know, heats up the attic air. And we're in an old 1958 home, relatively uninsulated. Well, that attic air gets to be 140 degrees. And that's right on top of what we're trying to cool, our home. So we put in a solar-powered attic fan, roughly $500, $600. It keeps the attic air plus or minus two degrees, or within two degrees of the outside air, changes the air constantly for free. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's almost, it's an instant payback within like nine to 10, maybe 12 months. Um, okay. And then it just pays off forever. Okay. A lot of things make sense, and it, it, it's fun just to go out and find new things. Now, we're hearing also that, that uh, green building is really important. It can save us a lot of money in the long run, and the government is even considering uh, making uh, federal buildings green. How, what kind of an impact does that have? Uh, It's a major impact. Buildings are the largest user of electricity uh, of all the things we do. And humans, of course, are the number one users of buildings, which most people forget. Uh, So, yes, building green is the first step. Uh, That's primarily uh, primarily one of the services I offer. Uh, Matter of fact, recently I've worked with one of the largest owners, developers, and managers of green buildings in the world. Uh, They've done an amazing job. Uh, reducing you know, their overall portfolio by over 30 or 35 percent of their carbon footprint. That saves them well over $100 million a year on their portfolio. Over 10 years, that's over a billion dollars. So, yes, the money's there, the carbon's there, but the key to success is really people. It's how you run the building. Right. You can give someone a great, great building. Um, there was a study that came out this year that showed of all the brand new green buildings, LEED certified, only some of them perform better. 25% perform better than 25% than the architects designed, but 30% they don't perform less than 25% below what the architect designed. So you give someone a green building, it really takes a great team, great tenants, families. Do you use your green home well? So conservation and the the attitude is what, and the practices, the habits. Explain what LEED building is so that... There's probably two major uh, green building uh, programs Codes, right. that are recognized worldwide and in the U.S. Energy Star is a great program. We all start with energy. So Energy Star says we start green by going blue or, you know, mm-hmm. with the Energy Star label. So that's focused on energy efficiency. Then you move from that to just green programs, uh, green features. Then you start certifying. The U.S. Green Building Council is a nonprofit that started about 15 years ago. Uh, and then they've really taken off. There's over 4 billion square feet of buildings in the world, about 20,000 projects that are striving for, it's an integrated design. So it's not just energy efficiency, it's healthier materials, it's better indoor air quality, it's, uh, it's how did you choose your site? Mm-hmm. Were you innovative? Uh, did you use things locally? And they're, they're taking, every year, they, or every two years, they upgrade that code. So there's there's two ways you can really start to speak to the world about how you have done a green building. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what are some of the top characteristics of a green building? Well, I, some people immediately go to technology. It's, right. it's not slapping on solar. Uh, it's really a holistic approach. Uh, you can design the building well, but then you have to operate it well forever. Right, right. So there's really two types of certification in both of those programs I just mentioned. Your design and then your operations. Um, so... In operations, which is the bulk of the the building's life cycle cost besides people, it's really how do you, uh, what are your practices, your policies, your procedures? Do you use uh, poisonous chemicals to do your green cleaning? Obviously, if it's green cleaning, there's no poisonous chemicals. So, again, it's focused on 
process habits okay. uh, up front. Yes, it's did we give them the right tools, the technologies? Right. Did we simple thing in homes? Did we orient our home correctly? Right, There's, right. To, to get sort of the the sun or the energy right from, and you, from the earth. Your hottest side of the building is west and south. So if we want to choose a, the proper house orientation. It'd be a long axis running east to west. Okay. You plant trees on the s- south side that lose their leaves in the fall and winter, and on the west side. Home Depot has uh, promoted the fact that you can save 30% on your energy costs forever just by planting those trees and orienting Amazing. the house correctly. These things have been around for thousands of years. So a lot of green you know, comes from not only our grandparents and the greatest generation who had to live through the Great Depression, but it's stuff that's been around for a long time. It's really being conscious about it, being aware of it. It is definitely an awareness. And that kind of leads me to, to, to my next question, because you, you talk about your grandfather a lot. How did you get into this topic? I mean, you, you got into sustainability before. You no, know, Now everybody wants to get into it, but, right. but you got into it at a time that it wasn't so popular. What, what is it about you that, that made you care about being green or living green? Probably uh, two or three things. My, first of all, definitely my grandfather is one of my heroes. And, you know, having lived through the Great Depression, he grew up on a hilltop in Arkansas with nothing. Um, so they really knew how to recycle. And that home, the cabin we lived in, was recycled, and we built it for 15 years. Wow. He, and it was it, probably a third of the cost of building a home otherwise. So they retired early. Um, he inspired me through the way they've lived. Then my mom. Uh, health is often a way that people go green too late. Um, almost everybody I meet um, that says I'm fanatic about green, they've had someone in their family or even personally that's encountered cancer right. or some very life-threatening right. illness right. or an allergy or something. Um, my mom had migraine headaches and still does, but we realized it was related to food and weather and different things. So those two things really impacted me early on, in addition to you know a faith experience in middle school when I became a Christian. Um, so if you want to take care of the things God gave you, why wouldn't we be green, especially if it makes a ton of money? Uh, so, you know, there's... <laughs> the American way. Don't forget about the money. That's right, entrepreneurship right there. So uh, yeah. that's what inspired me. Initially, though, when I started my consulting firm, it was one of my first clients. They took me to the first green building trade show, and I walked in, and there were 4,000 people there. And I said, oh, my goodness, organic food, hybrid cars, renewable energy, green buildings. This is something I wanted to do since I was a young man uh, or young boy. Wanted to be an architect, a builder. We all had, you know, little building blocks. Right. And I'd drawn floor plans for years and then wanted to become a business leader. This is where my uh, greatest passions and joys are able to meet the world's greatest needs. Right. And that's, that's what someone's calling or vocation is. And I was just fortunate enough to find that. Um, and so make money doing it. And make money is, doing you know, it, The American yeah. way. Now, you said there are two questions you need to answer when you're, when you're talking about living green. What are those? Those would be, uh, we talked about already, efficiency and conservation on one hand, which is the small part, mm-hmm. easy to, to digest and understand, and then the people. Salaries, benefits, um, people, costs are what matter in a business, in a building, in a home. So if we can focus on health and productivity, increasing test scores, like 2 to 20% just by having daylight. Schools are doing this. Uh, businesses are doing this. So these are things that we're just kind of rediscovering. Do you think as Americans we, we're talking enough about conservation? It seems to me that we, we don't talk. I mean, and that the easy, the, the best dollar is the dollar <coughs> saved. And, I agree and conservation completely. is not something that we, te- we tend to talk about a lot. It's a hard topic, especially as a business guy, as an MBA, uh, you know, right. working with CEOs. Right. The last thing you want to tell them is you need to sell less. Right. Well, we need to sell differently. And I think that's the most exciting thing is we're just we're about to shift um, how we allocate our resources, our time, reorienting our priorities. That's what this uh, last several years has done for the nation and for the right. world. Right. Um, and, I, yeah, I, I think that would be uh, the answer to your question. Um, yeah. Now, economic, economically, we're, we're facing tough times, and we probably will for, for a couple of years. Um, is that an opportunity in a way about for living green? Absolutely. Uh, conservation, in good times or in bad, is a good efficiency, thing? healthier homes, healthier buildings, less air pollution, it's a good way to go any way you look at it, good times or bad. Um, the challenge is being one of the first ones to do it. The earlier you start, the easier it gets, right, and the right. faster you save money and you get ahead of the competition. 
Right. So as a country, as a city, as a family, as a business, I'd encourage everybody to jump in early, even though it might be painful. But boy, as soon as you jump in, dip your toe in the water, it becomes so much fun. People start thinking you're a little bit of a freak. <laughs> but uh, uh, That's once you show the business freak, case, right? yeah. <laughs> you say that there's there's a, something called simple elegance, and we should think about living with simple elegance. What do you mean by that? Simple elegance for my wife and for me is having less but having more at the same time. Stuff tends to clutter um, and distract and also can cause me personally to become proud or you know, focus on the wrong things. So choosing to allocate money towards something that will last longer and be used and not go into landfill every two years uh, is a choice we try to make. And it, it makes life so much more free. You're, you know, the nation has a problem with debt. We all kind of went overboard there. Um, I think it's exciting to see how we're reorienting our priorities. We're going to take away the debt, live more conservatively, and choose to have things that last. Like green buildings, some of them, the designs that are mentioned at the conferences, some last 500 years. Like in England, there's a, uh, or in the Great Britain, there's a building that they built, and they thought 500 years out, how to have the forest ready, the trees ready to replace the beams in the building 500 years later. So oh. now that's forethought. And, and I know as a country of entrepreneurs and self-starters, we have that ability. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to be exciting to see how our nation and the world just goes uh, after this in the coming decade. Right. Now, you found a partner who, who likes to live green with you, your, your wife, and, and you refer to, in, in your courses, uh, to something called green romance. Tell me about that. What does that mean? Love is one of the first things you can catch someone with. So, yes, sometimes <laughs> we lead with the story, and then we quickly get to business. Uh, she wasn't so green when we started, okay. uh, which was uh, very fun to... Uh, I think she fell in love with me and then realized, wait a minute, this screen thing is a lot more serious than I ever expected. <laughs> uh, this guy's this for is real. his career. He's walking the talk. <laughs> but okay. it was just a management consultant. <laughs> uh, but she's now passing me, especially as we've had the baby. She does so much research that saves us so much money. A great example is our crib. We looked for cribs, and they're expensive. Uh, they can go from $500 to $2,000. We found one that on the website we purchased it from didn't even label it as green. We actually found it on other websites. It was green, sustainably harvested wood, uh, no toxic you know, wow. varnishes or lacquers or finishes. There was a, a wool mattress rather than one that's dipped in chemicals that the baby would breathe all the time. And it was only $500, and then we found a coupon for 50 bucks. So, I mean, you can have the ultra green lifestyle at a discount, and you just and have to fall take in love? time. Is that why you say green romance? Well, the, the romance <laughs> was really exciting. We fell in love by phone. Um, <laughs> I was turning around a sawmill in Savannah, Georgia, for five months. Went to church, met a young lady who happened to be my wife's younger sister's best friend, and uh, she set us up long distance. Six dates later, and a lot of phone calls. So we got what, married. Uh, that, that's, that's, a, that's what you call a green romance. And it's a great conversation piece anyway, right? <laughs> right. Uh, what about green kids? Green kids, well, part of my motivation was, uh, you know, people, of course. But as soon as we had a child and she started to, we started talking about being pregnant, um, you start learning some things that are disturbing, uh, like how many toxic chemicals are in women's umbilical cords. Almost 300 uh, and when I found that out, I was oh. like, wow, we really have to change our home and the way we live because I don't want to expose my daughter to those things or my wife or me. Um, I can handle some things, but when you're talking about a little you know, right, one-pound fetus you have to protect. that's not developed, um, we made some choices. And it actually got rid of allergies you know, to, to a large extent. There were so many ripple benefits that uh, it was worth it. Uh, and every time you look at her, you say... The future is green. You know, right, that's, right. that's my baby. Now, how, how do Americans become an inspiration by living green? A good example, uh, I was fortunate to hear the 11th uh, U.S. Secretary of Energy speak about now well, a couple of years ago. He'd had an encounter with his uh, political counterpart in China and said, when is China going to go green? Because a lot of people say China, India, mm -hmm. other countries, they're much oh. worse than we are. Right. They're the offenders. Start there. And the Chinese counterpart said, if Americans make it attractive, cool, sexy, um, fashionable, we'll follow. So, you know, going back to like the Bible, 
take the speck out of our or the log out of our own eye first, and, and then let's you know, take the speck out of someone else's eye. Right. I can change me. So if we start with us right. individually and as a country, I think the world will really take off. How do you know you're living smart? I know I'm living smart when I'm doing the right things at the right time, for the right reasons, with the right attitude. And on that note, thank you so much, Mr. Robinson. Thank you. And to learn more about this topic, go to our website. There you'll also find a complete resource list. You can also email us or call us with your comments at 713-743-8513. And that's our show for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Remember to live smart. I'm Patricia Gross. Have a green week. Thank you. For a transcript of this program, send 695 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest.